Hi friends! In this video I want to talk about my journey with Alexander Technique, which is still unfolding, thankfully. I uh, feel very much like a beginner with Alexander Technique, but it's been a really interesting thing that I've been exploring. Um, I think I first heard about Alexander Technique when I was working at a programming company in 2013, and my friend Eric, who I was working with, was uh, doing tango and he mentioned that the Alexander Technique had really helped him with tango and that seemed interesting but I didn't really have a chance to practice it at that time. And then when I was training at the Mask Academy my friend Miles got really interested in Alexander Technique and uh, he was raving about it and also um, when he would come to visit he uh, would sometimes do various posture corrections for people which was really cool because um, I've always had a hard time with meditation posture, as with many people, I think really in Western culture, um, because we're not practiced in sitting on the floor and sitting on cushions and that sort of thing. And we sit in chairs and don't have great posture. And the combination of posture feedback from Alexander Technique, but with the specific um, intent of helping meditation posture was really cool. And so he would do these sort of posture clinics where he would do Alexander technique with people and help them with their meditation posture and I thought that was really cool and yeah I think I had some interesting experiences when Miles adjusted my posture and I don't really remember quite what they were but it was clear that it wasn't just about the posture and that uh, something else seemed to be happening and yeah I'm hoping to work with Miles again on this sort of thing in the future but yeah and then my friend Michael Ashcroft of course uh, started creating his course online and I had known Michael through uh, rite of passage and just kind of being in the same Twitter universe and yeah I was excited that he started writing about Alexander Technique and then made a course. Um, you know when I first met Michael he was kind of figuring out what he wanted to talk about online and what what he wanted to share with the world and I always thought oh it'd be cool to learn more about Alexander Technique since I don't know much about that and I'm glad that he ended up deciding to share more about that and found a way to make an online course and when he made his course I was very excited about that and I hoped that um, you know it would help me with my meditation practice I thought maybe that Alexander technique and the way that he was talking about it would provide some different perspectives and tools on the meditation that I've been exposed to which was largely from Buddhist and Taoist contexts and other sort of uh, Eastern contemplative traditions and their modern Western teachings of those uh, Eastern teachings. Um, I was hoping that uh, the Alexander Technique stuff that he presented would complement that and deepen that. And yeah, I had access to his course and um, for some reason I had some kind of emotional blocks around taking it. So it was quite a while before I actually dove in and took the course and took the videos. But I was sort of talking with Michael about that and was like, yeah, I haven't actually taken the videos yet. and um, just been blocked about it and sort of talked with him about what the blocks were and then um, he was like well you know you could just kind of take a weekend and watch the videos and it's probably only you know four or five six hours of content you could get through it pretty quickly and um, of course there's exercises but you know just being exposed to what's in there and learning about it could be helpful and so I did that I took a weekend I think and did most of the videos then and yeah I found it so helpful it it really did what I was hoping for it complemented the meditation mindfulness stuff that I've been exposed to. There was a lot that was really helpful, um, but the thing that I really remember from the first time that I took the course was uh, I had done stuff with spacious awareness before, but the way that Michael talked about it um, really helped me stay in it more. Um, I could access spacious awareness, but the way that he talked about staying in it and noticing that when you were out of it for some reason it was almost like um a light a light switch switched for me and i was much more able to stay in it and notice when i got out of it and return to expanded awareness and so um that was really helpful for the first few weeks after taking the course and really months it was like either i was in expanded awareness most of the time or um i would really quickly notice when I was out of it and get back into it. And that was just really helpful. And um, there was a lot of specific things that uh, Michael shared in the course that were helpful too, but that was probably the most 
lasting and memorable impact. Um, I also remember noticing that um, really starting to develop an awareness of when other people had their awareness contracted or expanded. And really that's become, um, how to put this, uh, something I notice in everyday life and has made me pretty bullish on Alexander Technique and wanting this to spread because uh, I just notice how much it impacts our life when our awareness is contracted and how much things are better when it's expanded. And in particular, something that's really close to my heart is just how it's physically unsafe when people's awareness is contracted. I notice, you know, I'm often a pedestrian walking around and I notice looking at people driving in their cars that their awareness is contracted. And that really concerns me because you can't pick up on other cars or pedestrians or like traffic lights if your awareness is contracted. And so I don't know, long term, I would really like to see this sort of thing included in physical safety training because I think having your awareness expanded promotes safety in physically dangerous environments like driving and also um, having contracted awareness is pretty dangerous. So um, that's something I care about personally, but yeah, I'm also of course interested in the connections to Buddhism and meditation and how Alexander Technique relates to and complements um, meditation training and Buddhist practice, what the overlaps are, where they diverge, how they can support each other. That's another big interest of mine. Um, I'd say that, uh, yeah, I think after I took the course, I sort of corresponded with Michael for a while. He and I are friends. And so I would sort of ask him questions and we'd have calls and I would ask him questions and of course had him on my podcast. And um, you can see a couple of those conversations. I've had him on twice and I would sort of ask him questions about things that were alive for me. Really, as is often the case on my podcast, um, those conversations were sort of um, consciousness altering where there would be effects that would happen that would sort of persist and uh, sort of tweaks or adjustments that would be made and really found this helpful. Uh, I think one of the big questions that came up was with inhibition. At first, I sort of um, didn't know what it was. And then when I didn't learn what it was, it felt sort of um, oppressive, like I was punishing myself, like the sort of metaphor is like I was a kid and I wanted a piece of candy and there was an adult that was saying, oh no, you can't have the piece of candy. And Michael clarified that um, inhibition isn't about saying, no, you can't do the thing. It's about sort of pausing and um, expanding awareness and seeing if you still want to do the thing. And of course you can go do the thing. So I think once I made that shift and it felt less, yeah, I guess coercive and felt more non-coercive and didn't feel so yucky emotionally and start to feel good. And um, that opened up to noticing how when you inhibit, then you start to non-do things more. And this is a flavor that I had felt in other contexts at other times, but it started to become much more prominent. How to non-do speaking, for example, that's something that I had done quite a bit of um, found relatively easy, but that became easier and found myself doing it. Um, I started to have the experience of like making jokes from my abdomen. You know, there's a lot of meditation practice that I've done with the Hara or the Dantian, the lower Dantian, the abdominal area. And so it felt like jokes were coming from my abdomen rather than my head. Um, I don't know, other things, uh, motions of my body just doing themselves or, uh, various insights arriving, I don't know. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the big turning points I'd say as well was the second conversation that I had with Michael on my podcast where he started to talk about this aliveness quality and how he wants to focus more on that in upcoming uh, versions of his course. And he's told me that that's what he's gonna work on next. And I'm really excited about that because to the extent that I've been able to explore this quality of aliveness, it's been really, yeah, invigorating and joyful and exciting. And uh, I'm excited to see how he talks about it. Uh, in that conversation, he sort of explained what it was and then gave the exercise of imagining that you could do different things. So for example, right now there's some books behind the camera and I could go grab them and read them or I could walk out of this room or I could just stop the recording or I could make a silly gesture or uh, jump up and down. There's all kinds of things that I could do. and just noticing that you could do things sort of ex expands the range of possibilities and brings in the sense of aliveness. And 
for a while I, I was just sort of doing that exercise repeatedly and I found it particularly fun to, um, how to put it, uh, do, imagine doing things that are sort of uh, not allowed. Like, for example, I don't usually allow myself to like punch things or scream or like, I don't know, other transgressive things like uh, there's some white walls behind me. I could just like start writing on the walls, for example. Um, just noticing these sort of transgressive actions and that I could do them, even if I won't do them, I could, uh, you know, I could start screaming at the camera, for example, or, or make some, I don't know, I don't know what, but um, just imagining these different things. I found that to be kind of fun and liberating just to be like, oh, I could do that thing. And um, sort of defying this internal rule that I'd uh, created at some point or adopted and just think, oh, if I wanted to, I absolutely could do this thing that I thought I wasn't allowed to do. And yeah, I'd still maybe prefer not to, but I'm choosing not to rather than being implicitly, subconsciously forced not to or something. So that was kind of fun. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, with the aliveness stuff at a certain point, I started to notice other ways that uh, I'd already been noticing this quality. Um, in some ways, vocabulary or words around these things is tricky because they're just pointing to things that are in your experience that might already be there but you might not have noticed or they help you to notice them more. And so I start, you know, started to notice ways that I already was connecting to aliveness. And by noticing that consciously, I could sort of um, increase them. So for example, I listen to a lot of EDM and a lot of music and I'll dance a lot. And uh, I realized, oh, part of the reason I like this is because it brings me to life. I feel alive when I do it and my body moves differently and I'm more, you know, fluid and mobile and embodied and more joyful and noticing that that quality comes from listening to music and dancing um, has made me connect the Alexander Technique concept of aliveness to my dance music practice that already exists and sort of have these positive feedback loops between them where I like want to do that more and notice that quality of aliveness more and then notice it in other contexts as well. So that's been really nice. I think the most recent um, thing that's happened with my Alexander Technique journey is uh, coming to the UK and I've gone to two workshops with Peter in London and um, also got to meet Michael in person. And that's been really wonderful to have in-person training uh, with Michael's teacher, Peter, and with Michael. And, um, you know, I had Peter on the podcast, of course, and that was great. And um, you know, a lot of Michael's course is emphasized on the consciousness stuff and expanding awareness because that's what you can do online, but there are aspects of it that are sort of in person or easier to do in person or easier to explain in person or easier to notice in person and just getting repeated chances to do that kind of training that's embodied, that's in person, that has real live feedback from real people is really valuable. And I found doing Michael's course um, and having done a lot of practice with that made for really good preparation with the in-person embodied training. Uh, yeah, and oh, you know, I did two workshops in London while I've been here and um, yeah, just so much happened. It was really only like four or five days of training that I got to do, but um, so much was packed into that. And I think because of the prior Alexander Technique training I'd done and prior meditation training, I could really deepen in that and learn a lot very quickly. And um, uh, yeah, so much happened there. I mean, I got to work with Peter, I got to work with Michael, I got to work with different trainers that Peter is training. Um, he brought in another uh, trainer from Alexander Technique. Uh, I think Penny O'Connor is her name and she was wonderful. She'd done some stuff with Qi Gong and Tai Chi. So that was cool because I could kind of show her my Tai Chi and she could, share some Alexander Technique feedback about that. And yeah, just a lot of different things happen. We did so many different kinds of exercises and um, it feels uh, there's a lot there that I could describe and some of it's sort of still integrating. And so I'm not sure I'd be able to do it justice verbally to what kinds of things uh, I learned, but some things about like invitations where you're like putting your hand on someone and you you can sort of like suggest to them that you want to do something, but you're not forcing them to do it. You're inviting them into it. That's been really cool. And um, yeah, there's this theme of espresso shots where 
Peter or another teacher gives you this espresso shot where he puts your his hand on your back and sort of diminishes, contracts his awareness, and also his sense of aliveness, which feels awful, by the way, at least for me. I seem to be quite sensitive to it, and I think for other people that feel it, it's like, it doesn't feel very good. But um, he says that's kind of necessary for doing this. So he diminishes his awareness and then rapidly expands it and rapidly expands not only the awareness, but the sense of freedom to do things, or um, as I like to call it, like goodness or aliveness is uh, the other word for it, of course. And um, it's like, uh, you know, you're sort of like, and then, you know, <laughs> and uh, you're, you can feel it just being next to him with his hand on your back. It's like, because he's doing it, it's sort of, bleeds over into your experience and you can notice that happening and um, especially if you're sensitive to it or attuned to it and you get sort of a hit of that and uh, it's a bit like um, uh, what's the word for it satsang I think I don't know I haven't done satsang in the traditions that have that but it feels a bit like what that sounds like from the descriptions that I've heard of and so Peter just like brings in his Alexander technique and does it right next to you and uh, that rubs off on you and in some ways, the body really learns this more than the head does. So I'm a, I'm a conceptual person, I'm a verbal person, I like to write, I like to reflect verbally about what's happening as I'm doing this video, but my body is learning things from that experience and other experiences like that that I may or may not be able to conceptually articulate yet. Um, and that's been really cool. Uh, yeah, and just noticing various shifts with my body, like reportedly with some of the interventions that were made or the suggestions or experiences like my I got taller um, like apparently I like hide my height a little bit and I would just get taller from doing these exercises just a little bit and uh, I've always thought that my fight height was 5'11 but people are like no you're actually six feet tall and I don't know but uh, it does seem like these things can affect that and that seems to be something that happens for other people there are other people that reported similar things um, yeah I'm trying to think uh, yeah, a lot happens in those weekends and it's like multiple hours of training over multiple days. But uh, those were some of the things that I found most interesting and valuable. And I definitely want to take the opportunity to do more in-person Alexander Technique training when I can and have found it really valuable. So I'm looking forward to learning more. I'm looking forward to Michael releasing his aliveness part of his course and yeah, just diving into this more and learning what I can when I can, and that's been the journey so far.